Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. That was Cassius to Brutus from Julius Caesar, one of my favourite quotes, and I managed to get it into this year's Battle of Ideas programme, which cheered me up. Um, I um, was very interested in having this session, the battle against the fates, um, at this year's festival, because shaping our destinies and defying the notion of fate is obviously something we associate in a way with what makes us human and the modern era and not being victims of um, uh, situations beyond our control is something which gives us the courage and the, uh, the sense of future that means that we can imagine the world to be better, that we can change it and so on. So I found it fascinating over the last uh, period of time that it seems to me at least that the defiance of our fates and shaping our, our destinies has been somewhat circumscribed by a range of intellectual uh, fashions and uh, strands of thought uh, over recent years, that we're constantly told now that, of course, we can control our destiny, except that quite a lot about ourselves is hardwired in, either into our brains or through our genetics. Of course, we can uh, control our fate, but on the other hand, um, we are our identity, our cultural identity, we are defined very much, we're told, by where we're born, what circumstances we're born in, um, uh, uh, whether we're from a poor background, whether we're from a particular religious background, and people proudly boast of themselves as being part of communities, um, and the uh, anthem of the era from Lady Gaga is born this way, as though that somehow defines how you end up. It seems to me that something peculiar is happening in the contemporary period in relation to how we view ourselves and our fate. And what we wanted to do was to just explore that a little bit and to look at the issue of free will in the context of that. So let me uh, introduce my panel in the order in which they'll speak. First up, we're going to hear from Geoffrey Rosen, who is a professor of law at George Washington University, the legal affairs editor of the New Republic, uh, the non-resident senior fellow at Brookings Institute. He wrote a fabulous essay for the New York Times called The Brain on the Stand, uh, the influence, uh, looking at the influence of neuroscience on the American legal system. It's one of the reasons I thought of him for this keynote. He's been described by the LA Times as the nation's most widely read and influential legal commentator. His most recent book is The Supreme Court, The Personalities of, uh, and... Um, I don't know what it says, oh, rivalries that defined America, I can't read my own writing. And his uh, book, The Unwanted uh, uh, Gaze, uh, was described as the definitive text in privacy per perils in the digital age, and is a fantastic book, and well worth reading. So can we welcome um, Jeff? <laughs> the next person to speak will be uh, Steve Rayner, and welcome back to him. He, he was here um, in the past, last year. Uh, first time at a keynote, he's the James Martin Professor of Science and Civilization and the Director of the Institute of Science, Innovation and Society at Oxford University Syed Business School. He also directs the Oxford Programme for the Future of Cities. He's the Honorary Professor of Climate Change and Society at the University of Copenhagen. He served on a whole range of uh, UK and international bodies, uh, too many to mention, but just to say, one of those is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and another is the Royal Society's Working Group on Climate um, uh, uh, Engineering. And in 2008, in the Wired Smart List, he was considered to be one of the 15 people the next US president should listen to. I don't know whether he, he has. Didn't. No, no, all right. <laughs> but, but we're going to listen to him anyway. OK, can we give Steve a big welcome? Uh, third to speak uh, will be uh, uh, Frank Ferradi. Uh, a Battle of Ideas regular. He's the Professor of Sociology at the University of Kent. He's author of some of the most influential books uh, um, by any academic and non-academic indeed over the last decade. His books include The Culture of Fear, Paranoid Parenting, Where Have All the Intellectuals Gone, Invitation to Terror, Wasted, which is one of the best books ever written on schooling, and uh, his most recent book, which he'll be discussing 
uh, uh, tomorrow morning is tolerance in defence of uh, moral independence. We welcome back Frank Rayder. Um, and then I'd like to uh, introduce you to our novice, uh, in Battle of Ideas terms, of course, uh, it was Peter Hunter, who is a uh, Dominican friar, the principal uh, tutor in philosophy at Blackfriars Hall. Uh, Peter has a background in maths, physics and philosophy, and his current research interests are in philosophy of physics, biology and anthropology. His publications explore, amongst other things, the nature of thought and will, and the question of machine intelligence, and the relationship between science and religion. Can we give him a very warm welcome? Thank you. OK, thanks. Jeff, kick us off. Well, it's a great pleasure to be back at the Battle of Ideas. And the question of the death of free will is obviously a special anxiety of Claire Fox and the battle, because it seems like I've been on a whole series of panels over the years claiming the end of free will. Uh, so to shake things up a bit, I'd just like to argue that the premise of this uh, panel is wrong and that Lady Gaga was wrong to say that uh, it's the fact that we're born this way that determines our fate. In fact, in practice, it's not new insights in brain science or genetics or evolutionary psychology that are challenging our ability to reinvent ourselves and control our identities. Instead, it's the death of privacy and in particular, the end of our ability to escape our pasts on the internet that is created by the death of digital forgetting. And to try to persuade you of this thesis, I want to offer up the example, well known to some of you, of Stacy Snyder. Stacy Snyder was the 22-year-old teacher who a few years ago, just before she was about to graduate from Teachers College in Pennsylvania in America, uh, made the mistake of posting a picture of herself on her uh, MySpace page in a pirate's hat, drinking from a plastic cup and with the caption, Drunken Pirate. And her supervisors saw this picture and decided that she was promoting underage drinking. They fired her from her job as a teacher. As a result, she wasn't able to graduate from teaching college. She sued, saying that her free speech rights under the American Constitution had been infringed. After all, it wasn't illegal to wear a pirate's hat. But a federal judge rejected the claim, saying her speech wasn't on a matter of public concern. She was a public employee, and she had no constitutional protection. As a result, she was not able to become a teacher, and she is today working in human resources. Now, the problem of Stacy Snyder, yes, if not, <laughs> feet worse than death, absolutely. <laughs> Just terrific. <laughs> Especially if you've dealt with uh, human resources at, at any uh, university, you know, you know how, how appalling this is. <laughs> Uh, the Stacy Snyder problem is not unique to this young woman. All of us have either experienced or have friends or see every day examples of people who are struggling to escape their pasts and reinvent themselves. There was the young British girl who was fired because she wrote on Facebook that she was so totally bored by her new job. There was the Canadian psychotherapist turned away at the US border because a border gate did an internet search and found a journal article that he'd written 30 years ago describing his youthful experimentation with LSD. Far more than these new claims about the causal roots of human behavior, it's the fact that the internet never seems to forget that's threatening at an almost existential level our ability to control our identities, to preserve the option of reinventing ourselves and starting anew, and to overcome our checkered past. So in other words, it doesn't matter why we make the missteps we do. It doesn't matter whether our actions were determined or caused by our brains or our genes or our bad relationships with our mommies and daddies. What matters is the fact that the missteps once made are difficult to escape because the worst thing we've done is often the first thing that others know about us. Uh, it wasn't supposed to be this way at the dawning of the age of the internet. Uh, we were told that the ideal of the self-made man, uh, so under siege by the end of the western frontier where you were supposed to be able to leave your past behind and go to Texas, uh, was going to be resurrected by the internet, that we were going to be able to segment out our identities into different avatars and screen names and have total control over the conditions of our exposure. But this hope proved to be a myth. As social networking sites expanded, it wasn't so easy to have segmented identities. Uh, now that people use a single platform to post constant status updates, the idea of a home self and a work self and a fr family and friend self has become increasingly untenable and often arouses suspicion. Uh, that's why I think it really doesn't matter why our, our behavior is caused. The fact is we're being held accountable for it more than ever. 
Uh, we can address what I think are the overblown claims of causality in fields like neuroscience. It was 2007, Claire, that you had that excellent panel called My Brain Made Me Do It. And I expressed skepticism back then, and I have uh, just as much skepticism now, that advances in what's called neuro law will in fact transform the criminal justice system. Back then, some radical determinists like Robert Sapolsky of Stanford were arguing that since everything we do is determined by our inherited genes, criminal law can't hold us responsible for our actions, and retribution is not only nonsensical, but immoral. Uh, so the idea of holding people responsible for their freely chosen actions, said Sapolsky, makes no sense in light of brain imaging studies. Uh, if you have a horrifically damaged uh, brain, you might not uh, be able to control your behavior. Your amygdala made you do it. And rather than treating criminals as evildoers who should be punished, he said someone with a broken brain should be locked up for the purpose of deterrence, like a car with broken brakes shouldn't be allowed on the street. Well, regardless of the philosophical merits of that position, I'm more convinced by the arguments uh, of people like Stephen Morse of the Pennsylvania uh, University who warn of a brain overclaim syndrome. And note that neuroscience is nothing new. There are always causal explanations of human behavior uh, that make claims about transforming the law, from sociological claims about the environment to arguments about genetics and evolutionary psychology. But the law resists these claims because causation can't be an excuse for someone who believes responsibility is possible. Because all of our behavior is caused, that would mean that all behavior has to be excused. Morse gives the example of the man who killed his wife in 1966, shot 13 students on a campus of the University of Texas, and then claimed his amygdala made him do it because of a tumor uh, in his brain. But even if the amygdala made him do it, what, since when should anger be an excusing causation? Some people are angry because they had bad childhoods, others because their amygdalas are mucked up. The question is, when should anger be an excusing condition? And in Anglo-American law, we hold people criminally responsible unless they act under duress with a gun pointed at the head or if they suffer from a serious defect in rationality, like not being able to tell right from wrong. But if you suffer from a serious defect, the law doesn't care why, whether it's an unhappy childhood or a cyst or, or both. To suggest that criminals should be excused because their brains make them do it seems to imply that anyone whose brain isn't functioning properly could be absolved of responsibility. But again, that's not a claim unique to brain science. And since judges and juries have no inclination to absolve people of responsibility, neuroscience's actual effect on the legal system remains modest. I'm interested, finally, in the ways that our identities are being affixed to us on the internet, not only by material that we mistakenly post about ourselves, but by digital profiles created about us by companies like Google and Facebook, often without our knowledge and consent. Uh, it's sobering now that we lived in a world misleadingly called a global village uh, to think about uh, privacy in actual small villages years ago. In the Babylonian Talmud, if you made a mistake, it was a terrible sin, and the sin would be written down in the Book of Heaven. But you could atone for it. You could go to someone and ask for forgiveness. And if you asked for three times, you were supposed to be forgiven. It's a sin not to grant the forgiveness. By contrast, the current keepers of the digital cloud have, who have made the metaphor literal, now every word we speak literally ascends to a, a heaven attended by Google with its distributed uh, servers, are far less forgiving. Uh, Eric Schmidt, the head of Google, said uh, not long ago, uh, if people choose to post something of themselves and make a mess of themselves, uh, that's just something that they have to live with. It's fine, he says. They, that's their choice and they have to live with it. So in other words, uh, Google is, is disinclined to allow people to escape their mistakes. And Google, with its predictive search uh, functions uh, on the new Chrome uh, device, are creating profiles about us that can become more real than the identities that we choose for each other. You're placed in digital segments based on your past behavior and your consumer behavior, and have then sent targeted ads that are increasingly following us in every aspect of life on our mobile devices and soon in real space too. And our ability to escape the fact that Google thinks we're one kind of consumer, more likely to buy this product and to be interested in this search, uh, whereas in fact we define ourselves very differently, uh, is increasingly under siege. So for all of these reasons, I think that I'm looking forward to learning from my colleagues about uh, the philosophical basis of uh, the deterministic claims about effects on human behavior. But in practice, I want to argue the way that we actually uh, experience our uh, ability to control our identities. It doesn't much matter why our actions uh, were caused the way they are, but our ability to escape from our digital profiles is increasingly elusive. And that's why I think Claire uh, your, the quotation with which you began was uh, exactly right. Uh, the fault, dear Brutus, does lie not in our stars, but in ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.
Okay. So Jeff's obviously got the, the gist of the battle of ideas because he started off challenging the whole premise of the session and then insulted HR officers in the middle of it all. <laughs> so, you know, that's the spirit in which we want to carry on. Steve. Thanks very much. Um, I must say I was a little bit puzzled when I received the very welcome invitation to come back to the battle of ideas this year. And I was a bit puzzled because of the topic that I was asked to address since I'm not an expert in neuroscience. And I hadn't really consciously thought about issues of free will and determinism uh, since I was a philosophy undergraduate uh, too many years ago to contemplate at this point. Um, but of course, that's not going to stop me talking about them. Um, as for neuroscience, uh, I think the first thing that I would suggest is that we need to be very sceptical of claims that are made by it and even more so sceptical of claims that are made for it. Uh, it seems to me, from what little I... Uh, have understood of it, that it's essentially at the stage now where you might describe it as the phrenology of the 21st century. Uh, it's more or less limited to the detection of patterns of changed blood flow in various parts of the brain under various stimuli. And one of the most interesting things about it is the way in which those patterns of blood flow are represented pictorially, visually, uh, as the brain lighting up. And you've all seen these wonderful slides of sort of various cortexes and things being illustrated in glowing colours. Of course, the brain doesn't light up at all. All this is is a way of actually representing some changes in blood flow. And then to make the causal connections that have been made on behalf of it uh, seems to me to involve a huge leap uh, of, if not faith, I don't know quite what. Um, so I think, uh, you know, firstly, there's good reason to be uh, sceptical that this is really getting much further than noting where bumps are on people's skulls, uh, which was very popular about 100 years ago. Uh, at the best, I think we can say that uh, the, the neuroscience at the moment is at the stage where genetics was uh, a decade or so or more ago, as Claire alluded to earlier, when genetics was going through a phase of trying to find the gene that caused everything. And Modern genomics has gone beyond this point now. Nobody ever looks for the gene that causes a particular trait. We recognize that there are multiple genes involved in uh, aspects of personality, aspects of uh, our physical selves and so on. It's the interaction among genes and between the genetic material and, guess what, yes, the social and environmental uh, context in which we operate that actually seems to be shaping uh, behavior or the expression uh, of certain kinds of characteristics. And there's a very peculiar uh, thing that's gone on with the brain, which is also worth mentioning, which is the separation of the brain and the person. Um, so, so as if somehow or other, as Jeff referred to, you, know, you could say, my amygdala made me do it, uh, which is, involves a very peculiar sort of epistemological uh, and ontological move. Um, turning to uh, the area of free will and determinism, uh, I have to say that I was always... Uh, very sympathetic to uh, Marx's claim that people make history but not under circumstances of their own choosing. And I think it's fairly clear to me, or it was at the uh, time I, even when I was an undergraduate, the, the existence of constraints and opportunities doesn't in, does not resolve us of responsibility. And I think responsibility is really the key underlying issue uh, for us in this discussion today. Um, Mary Douglas, the anthropologist, uh, who, by the way, also wrote extensively about memory and forgetting and the social importance of the construction of memory, uh, was very uh, clear uh, that the, to her, the, concept, the very concept of culture was the framework of accountability that societies construct for themselves. It's the way we account to other people for our behavior and the way in which we uh, call them to account to us for their behavior that provides uh, the very stuff of culture. It's what we do in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, we make culture afresh each morning by the way in which we actually give accounts of each other, both in the sense of narratives, but also give accounts in the sense of justifications. And the ways in which we do that vary tremendously around the world, but the notion that accountability is a key component, a defining characteristic of culture, and we would say all human societies have culture, um, at least as somebody trained in anthropology, I think I'd have to say that. Um, it does suggest that this whole issue of responsibility is in fact a universal human concern. There's not a single society in which you don't find some kind of framework of justification uh, 
uh, of this sort that I'm describing. And so that would seem to give some sort of uh, just, uh, 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 reality, some kind of justification for the kind of concern that perhaps C.S. Lewis expressed rather extremely, that once you start to medicalize and once you start to uh, create frameworks uh, of, uh, of, of exceptionalism for responsibility, you start to gnaw away at the very foundations of what it is to be fundamentally a human being. Uh, and that's a sort of a, count, a cultural, I think, account of, of, of the importance of the issue. Uh, now, the, the question of the extent to which you can be held accountable obviously has taxed uh, human beings for generations and continues to tax us in different uh, social and cultural contexts. What we are really talking about when we, I think, the, the whole issue of law, for example, is that law isn't... Uh, a problem, or uh, law doesn't constrain the behaviour of most of us under the, uh, the, 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 the large part of the bell curve. It's, it's for when we're in the tails of the distribution. It's when we're tempted to go beyond social norms of behaviour and expectations and uh, our sense of morality. And the whole point of law at that point is to help to reinforce the kinds of behaviours uh, and frameworks of accountability that society finds acceptable. Most of us don't think, I'm not going to kill somebody today because it's illegal, right? Um, so it's really, it seems to me that the debate is about how far into that tail we want to go in actually uh, ascribing people with responsibility and making them, in some sense, accept that responsibility and make atonement. Uh, pay the price, however you want to frame it, whether you want a, a sort of a narrative of revenge, a narrative of justice, a narrative of forgiveness, um, and to what extent uh, we uh, are going to allow exemption from claims of responsibility. Uh, there are many cases uh, very clear about this. One of the clearest is in the case of uh, concentration camp guards, for example, who, uh, you know, you could say that... Uh, were faced with the moral problem of their own extermination. I'm talking about the ones who were recruited from uh, among local populations rather than the SS themselves, um, who were themselves faced with the prospect of extermination if they did not cooperate with the uh, machinery uh, of uh, extermination within the camps. Uh, to what extent do you hold somebody responsible under those conditions uh, of coercion, uh, for example? Uh, and so I think the... the uh, uh, the f final remark that I would say, oh, the, the one other thing I just wanted to mention uh, was uh, uh, that the thing I remember from my undergraduate days was Moritz Schlick of Carnap's Vienna Circle, uh, who was very clear that, in fact, in negotiating this problem of free will and determinism, that free will implies a certain degree of determinism, that if there's not regularity in uh, the behavior of the universe, um, Actions will be wholly random, and then you can't be responsible for them. So responsibility, again, uh, comes back to the forefront here. Conversely, the idea of responsibility is required uh, if you're going to have some degree, uh, degree of choice. So it seems to me that the problem that we're facing is what's the tipping point between destiny and choice? Where it lies is, I would argue, historically and culturally variable, and that the human condition is to wrestle with that, not to resolve it, to wrestle with that tension not to resolve it. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. That's... <laughs> thank you. Um, Frank, can you give us your thoughts, please? Yeah, uh, one of the things I'm interested in is the way in which, historically, the relationship between determinism and free will is, is mediated. Because, you know, it's unthinkable to have any society where you have either one or the other. It's, every society expresses a, a certain cultural mood uh, that is fatalistic, that is slightly deterministic. And within every society, even in the most deterministic moment, there are hints of an attempt at free will. What I'm interested in is the balance. You know, if you look at, for example, ancient Athens, it's a very exciting time when, for the first time, people begin to realize that laws are conventional, and therefore they're subject to human change and variability. And you've got this incredibly interesting development of free will. Then you move back into other societies which are wholly deterministic, parts of medieval Europe, 
where, in a sense, everything is determined by the ancients. You know, the, the antiquity had all the answers. Mm -hmm. And your life is kind of played out to a script that was written a long time ago. You move into the Renaissance, where people are, are grappling and wrestling uh, with Fortuna and trying to determine how much of their life is determined by their action, how much is already predestined, all the way to today. I think what's interesting about the 21st century, particularly in the Western society, is that we do live in probably the most fatalistic moment since modern time has began. If, if you take the 17th century as a period of skepticism, as a period where people are asking all kinds of questions, you do get to a cultural mood that continually draws deterministic conclusions. So when Jeff at the very beginning talks about the internet, the question that I'm interested in is why is it that you have the invention of the internet that raises all kinds of possibilities and yet what comes out of that is the, is the fossilization of our identity. Why should that be the case? Why should our identity become so static? Why isn't the potential for freedom uh, sort of given a, a clearer expression through that? And I think if you unpack our, our culture, you'll find that in every domain of human experience, the dominant mood, the dominant expressions, the way that causality is represented is in a highly one-sided deterministic framework. It doesn't mean to say that we don't have elements of free will in our society or attempts to express that or individuals striving to take responsibility, striving to take risk, but all the time is the deterministic interpretation that dominates. I'll talk about three forms of determinism. One is cultural, which I think is the most important one because it underpins that. And basically what cultural determinism is is the, the way in which every social problem is recast into a framework where it's interpreted fatalistically. So for example, uh, we all know that everything that happens to you in your childhood determines what happens in adulthood. And although Freud talked about it, and others talked about it in the 19th century, the intense way in which it's now represented is unprecedented. And the English language has changed. So for example, children have a, you know, something bad happens to them, are scored for life. You know, we have expressions like scored for life. Children become damaged for life. And there's a whole host of metaphors that we use to signal the idea that a bad thing happening to a kid is a lifelong sentence. We have theories in sociology that tells us that if you've been abused, you're likely to have gone on to abuse other people. And one of the first things, that, I don't know if you ever watch Hollywood films, they're very good uh, sort of markers for this. Every time they talk about a pedophile or a serial killer, it only takes two seconds to discover that that person was abused when they were a child. And, and there we now know it. We, we now understand why they become serial killers and all the rest of that. If you look at the, the language of therapy, these days the language of addiction you know, sort of expands into all kinds of uh, sort of experiences. And what happens is that you never actually overcome addiction because from a fatalistic point of view, you're an alcoholic in recovery. You haven't had a drink for the last 40 years, but that doesn't mean you're not an alcoholic. You're an alcoholic in recovery. And you have, you know, you have cancer and you fought cancer and you've done really well, you, you feel brilliant, but you're kind of a, a cancer you know, person in recovery. And the recovery thing is added to that all, all the time in every single st uh, stage. Just the other week, last week, or famous secretary for pensions, Ian Duncan Spitt, told us that from now on, they're gonna be uh, interested in fighting crime by tackling it at the point where children in problem families are in the mother's womb. And I think that idea that you know, looking into your mother's womb, or the mother's womb becomes you know, sort of the way in which you deal with the problems of the future. Again, in Hollywood terms, it's called pre-crime. I don't know if any of you have seen you know, the minority report, where you are already dealing with, not with the crime that might have happened, but there's already an element of pre-crime. And I could go on and on and on. And every time I debate somebody about children, I'm always told that the real problem, Frank, what you don't understand, is that children's behavior is dominated by advertising. And then you begin with children, you know, you know no advertising for children, and then we're told that you and I, as consumers, are slaves to the advertiser. It's almost as if we watch you know, somebody selling us cars and we kind of go, you know, get our credit cards and immediately go out and buy one because we become entirely enslaved to it. So there is cultural determinism.
I think the second form of determinism is biological determinism. And I don't want to go into that because it's already been mentioned, but there's a lot of discussion, I think, at this conference on neurodeterminism, on the way that genetics has been recast, almost like a cultural form to <coughs> inform us that uh, our behavior is determined by uh, who we are. And I think what's very interesting, I mean, I find this particularly nauseating as it happens, is that increasingly there's a new strand of philosophy and a new strand of ethics and of moralizing where ethical and moral judgments are explained in, in, a, in genetic terms, that we have a genetic disposition towards altruism. We have a genetic disposition towards being liberal as opposed to being conservative. Where even love, you know, the, a very intimate act of love is reinterpreted as, as somehow driven by, by our genetic makeup and, and can be explained in those kinds of terms. Now, of course, there's a lot of people that are skeptical of this, but I think it's interesting that if you go to a bookshop in New York or Washington or Toronto or Paris, you'll find that the, these are the books that are expanding on the shelf. They're, they're, they're important cultural markers. They're, they're the one that takes that. And if there's one expression that I, I learned to loathe and, I, and hate, is it turns out, you know, whenever you hear a neurodeterminist, they say, well, we always thought, Frank, ho, 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 that, you know, you, you kind of decided for yourself to, you know, sort of pick, you know, kind of find a wife or husband. Well, it turns out, and they kind of bring out the statistics. And you know that every time they use the term, it turns out, what they're saying is no way there's any causal link. You know, it's, it's not something that you're responsible for. It's entirely out of your hands. The third form of determinism, uh, equally influential, but appears to be very different, is environmental determinism. And the idea that nature, in its different guises, uh, limits the options that we have. That somehow government policies have got to be determined by an, a variety of environmental problems. This week we have this hysterical uh, sort of week. Uh, everybody's worried about the fact that you know, sort of we now have billions of people on the planet. And, and somehow, we have too many people, and it turns out that because of that, you know, this and that policies are, are no longer viable. And now what, what, what we have is our arguments where, you know, in a sense, the, the, the options for freedom are very, very limited. So in the old days, the conservative argument was that the legacy of the past determined your autonomy. You, th you think you're autonomous, but actually it's the legacy of the past, the sins of your father, and all that stuff, they limit as to what you could really do. And therefore, your, your behavior for expressing free will was really constrained. Today, we not only have the legacy of the past, the sins of our fathers, but we also have the future bearing down upon us as, as a burden. Because apparently, because we have a, a negative generational transaction, because we're not really you know, doing our bits for future generation, we've got to watch how we behave in order to destroy, not to destroy the globe, for young kids that might be born 50, 60, 100 years down the road. So what we have is a situation where we squeeze between the future and the present in a way that would make, make Edmund Burke seem you know, uncomfortable. And, you know, sort of, and he's the one that always told us not to be so arrogant as to imagine that we're doing anything for ourselves. Uh, because now both the future and the past squeeze us into this ever long present where, culturally speaking, you know, it's only, you know, sort of on the margins that we can ever do anything for ourselves and where causality ultimately uh, has this kind of very minimalist, you know, sort of uh, kind of reality about it. So I think there is an important battle to be fought on the cultural front because I think the way you fight neurodeterminism is not by becoming a neuroscientist. The way you fight therapeutic medicalization is not by becoming a psychiatrist. The way you find environmental skepticism it's not by becoming an environmental scientist, but actually looking at the cultural underpinnings of all of these pressures. Thank you very much, Frank. <laughs> Thanks. Frank, plenty there that we can argue about afterwards, but Peter, your thoughts, please. Good. Um, it strikes me that there is a sort of a tension between scientists of various sorts, and I use the term scientist in a very broad sense, um, people who want to explain how things are. Um, scientists want things to be predictable in various ways. That's, that's their job. 
Their job is to discover the predictability of the thing that they're studying. They want to see patterns and they want to see repeated things that they can measure, things that, that, that turn up all the time, predictions that they can make about the future. And of course, we want to know about ourselves perhaps as much or more than we want to know about the rest of the world. That's natural. We want to know what kinds of creatures we are. And so we use our scientific tools to study ourselves, and that's a great thing. I think that's a wonderful thing. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is the more we study ourselves, the more we uh, try to make ourselves predictable, try to make ourselves something that falls under the kind of discipline that the natural sciences are. Uh, but the more we do that, the more we make it hard for ourselves to see that we're free. And yet, in a sort of unreflective moment, I suspect most of us find our freedom one of the most remarkable and, and obvious things about ourselves. I think we should uh, see that freedom in ourselves and we should uh, see ourselves as free in spite of the fact that so many parts of our lives now are explainable in terms of genetic predeterminism, uh, predispositions, in terms of, of hardwiring of our neurons, in terms of cultural pressures on us, and so on. All the kinds of things the other speakers have been talking about. But we should see ourselves as free, and this is not just because of responsibility, though I think that's a big, a great, a great part of why uh, uh, we should see ourselves as free. Uh, we, we are responsible for our actions. We should hold ourselves and others responsible for our actions, to differing degrees, of course, depending on, on, how, on how free they are. Uh, different things compel us to do the things we do. But freedom isn't just important for responsibility. It seems to me it's absolutely core to the whole way in which we see human life. It's core to the whole way in which we interrelate, not just morally, but intellectually too. So all of you came here hoping to hear an interesting debate. But if you were really convinced that the words coming out of each of the four speakers' mouths was simply produced by our genetic predispositions and our, you know, all of the rest of the whatnot, you couldn't actually ascribe to any of the words we're using any meaning at all. I had a telephone call the other day, which was one of those annoying telemarketing things which leads you down a very predictable uh, conversational path. And although it's actually recorded, it sounds at least at first as if you're talking to a real human being. But then, of course, you make an out-of-band, uh, an unpredictable response, and the recording goes on mechanically saying what it was going to say. Now, I suspect, and of course, at that moment, you realize you're talking to a machine. Now, I suspect most of us, that's exactly how we would feel about meaning if we were to believe that the others around us were completely determined by our genes and all the other things. So I think we should believe we're free. It's absolutely essential to our humanity that we're free, not just to our responsibility, which is vital, but to the very meanings of our words. Um, so that's a, a sort of impassioned, I hope, um, defense of freedom. And I think freedom is really vitally important, but we have to also think about what kind of freedom we want. And this is sort of going to chime in with a lot of what the other pan panelists have said, I hope. Because um, I think some politicians uh, talk about freedom all the time, but what they really mean is freedom to purchase, which of course involves having money, and of course means a large part of the world's population, even a fair bit of this country's population, is excluded from those choices. So we, and again, choice very often means for us something rather trivial. You know, am I going to have this from the menu or am I going to have that from the menu? And so we've tended to see free choice as being between options about which I don't care, care very much. Um, 
if I care greatly about one of the options, I'm always going to do that and not gonna, I'm not going to choose the alternative. And that makes me look perhaps less free on one account. I'm always going to choose this alternative. I'm never going to choose that one. But actually, if you think about it, all the biggest choices in my life, all the biggest choices in my life, in your lives, are like that. All the biggest choices in your lives are the ones where, in fact, you would never have done the opposite. Suppose you meet someone who is very brave and they see someone in danger, you know that they will save that person or act to save that person. Does that mean that the, that the brave person acted unfreely? Of course not. They acted from who they were. And those are the freest kinds of choices that we ever make. And so really, what we want is not just choice over the trivial things in our lives. What color should my dress be? That's not the kind of choice we want. We want choices which enable us to determine who we are and how we live our lives. And I think those are the kinds of choices we need to be defending, choices which are open to everybody, the great choices where, in fact, very often, it's not a choice between two trivial alternatives. It's a choice between something rather awful and something enormously attractive. It seems to me unfortunate that very often we have bought a view of ourselves as determined, but even if we haven't, we bought into a bunch of pressures on us which determine us and don't need to. So there are all sorts of societal pressures which, I mean, culture can make us free, can give us responsibility and all sorts of other things, but it can also, t culture can also be a tyranny. Uh, if you find yourself in a minority, in a culture that despises that minority for whatever reason, your freedoms are significantly restricted. And that's a, sh that's a shame. And, and actually what you find is people tend to choose options that fit in with what their friends and family expect, or at least to some extent. Um, choosing against the, the grain, choosing against the stream is actually very hard to do. We don't encourage it. I don't think any, any culture encourages it. So it's true that culture gives us a way to Keep, bring each other to account, but actually that can be an overbearing thing. It can actually destroy our freedom as well as create it. Thank you very much. Okay. So I, I, I'm actually just going to ask two very quick questions. I, come back to Jeff first, I think, just because you might want to come back on anything, Jeff. So if you just like quickly respond, and then I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions. Get ready to put your hands up there. Jeff, anything you want to come back on specifically? It seems absolutely right that law only ascribes responsibility when there's social consensus. And I, 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 uh, I, I take the point very much. But my uh, concern is that at a time when people feel no ability to control their identities, they may turn to law to uh, uh, allow them to do it for them. So there's now a new proposal in the European Union that comes uh, from the French data commissioner, and it's called the right to oblivion, the droit à l'oubli. This is very French. Uh, <laughs> Americans want to be remembered, and the French want to be forgotten. And the idea is that you should be able selectively to delete your past, to uh, remove embarrassing pictures about yourself because you've thought the better about them. They, they offend your moral dignity. And an Argentinian pop star uh, filed under this right of oblivion. Uh, she posed for some racy pictures and she petitioned a court. And the court actually ordered Google and Yahoo to take the pictures down. Yahoo said they couldn't do it. And as a result, they removed all references to this woman from the Yahoo search engine because they couldn't delete her selectively. This is such a crude and unsatisfactory substitute for the kind of nuanced description of responsibility that genuine communities can actually enforce that I worry with that. Uh, I, I don't, don't think there was strong disagreement, I'm afraid to say, among the panelists about the need to as, uh, act as if we are uh, free and to try to resurrect notions of autonomy. But I'm concerned that at a time when people feel unable to shape their identities, they're going to turn to law in a crude and heavy-handed way to do it for them. OK, uh, Steve, what, what, one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you um, is, 
in many ways, we associate the emergence of science, I mean, you know, particularly in a kind of modern period in the, in the Enlightenment and so on, with, in a way, freeing us from our fates. I mean, that it was a kind of great liberation. Whereas now, as has been illustrated, not just in neuroscience, but, you know, it's evolution meets psychology, it's uh, the genetics, the whole discussion. But I think that, that, that also Frank um, Freire suggested the point about our attitude to nature. But broadly speaking, we are constantly told, I have had rows at least, with scientists who say, oh, you're clay, you're so cute about these things. But, you know, science has shown us that we are not, you know, we are the, no more than animals in a way, but sophisticated animals. So science is being used in a bizarre way to take us back. Yeah, I mean, I, I revert here to, once again, to um, uh, the late Mary Douglas, who was uh, well known for continually pointing out that nature is the trump card that people play to win any argument. When you've exhausted God, money, and time, basically we fall back, <laughs> we fall back on nature. It's only natural to love your parents. It's not natural to pick the, uh, the legs off insects and torture them and, um, and, and this kind of thing. And by invo invoking nature, basically what we say is, this is the way it is. There is no further discussion possible. Now, in the modern world, we don't really encounter nature directly. We encounter it mediated through science, particularly two kinds of science. Our experience of external nature is mediated through environmental science. And I think, you know, when Frank starts talking about the way in which uh, we know, for example, within the climate debate and other environmental debates, the whole, you know, the environment is used as a way to uh, best persuade and at worst coerce people into new patterns of behaviour on the basis that if you don't, nature is going to come back and bite us all in the ass. And then there's internal nature, which is mediated by the concept of medicine. And this is why, in fact, most scientific controversies that are public controversies are either about human health or about the environment. They're not about large hadron colliders, for the most part because basically that doesn't impinge on, on these kinds of areas. Uh, so I think, yes, um, you know, what we're really looking at here isn't so much that science itself has changed, but there's a different cultural mood in the society at large, which then deploys these sciences as the contemporary representations of nature in order to be persuasive in, in political rhetoric. And I think in that sense, I'm, I'm very much uh, in tune with what Frank was saying. Okay, thanks. Frank, both an opportunity really to, to see if you've got anything to come back to Jeff about, just in, in terms of his original challenge, that, it, that this isn't an issue. But I, one of the things that maybe we haven't touched on, but which is, strikes me as important, is just the, just the sense that you get when you talk to people that, that almost of a kind of conspiratorial thinking, that there's like all these external forces that, that out there. I mean, you kind of talk, you know, whether it's, it, it's kind of nature, but sometimes it can be big business, sometimes it could be Google, all these people who are manipulating you. And that you feel as though, uh, uh, even the concept of change itself, people say, for example, in education, we have to change the curriculum because, you know, everything's changed. Change, and change is almost personified as something we're keeping up with. The internet is something we have to, uh, uh, we are victims to rather than creators of. Anyway, any sort of thoughts on that kind of broad atmosphere? Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is, is best summed up by the metaphor, the forces of globalization. And the minute you say force of globalization, that explains everything. <laughs> right? that's, that's how it's kind of invariably used. I just got two really small points on, on, uh, on Peter's point. Uh, you see, the way that I look at it is that how you regard freedom and your attitude towards determinism is influenced by the context within which you live. And given the fact that there seems to be so much cultural af affirmation for deterministic thinking, I take the view that it's actually not right to make a distinction between the freedom to choose between trivial things and the freedom to choose between really important things. So I'm actually quite critical of all these attempts, particularly by policymakers that tells us, oh, you're being so foolish, you, you know, you're spending so much time deciding between yellow and green, and isn't it horrible that you know, all these people are, are so dominated by advertisers that, you know, that, that their freedom is the freedom to consume? Now, I know the argument, and I know that freedom is always differential. It depends on resources, it depends on, on, on power. But nevertheless, the reason why I'm not gonna make go down this road is because I know that in the 21st century, the argument that isn't this trivial, you know, the, the freedom to consume and all the rest of that. Is all, that argument is always a prelude 
to somebody coming along and telling you that I'm going to make the choice for you. And therefore, you have new Labour governments telling us that they're going to make healthy choices for us. You know, you have Jamie Oliver telling us to, you know, that you know, I'm not going to let you eat that you know, cheeseburger because you know, it's not really good for you, but I, Jamie Oliver, know exactly what you need. And you have a whole set of policies being implemented that actually deprive you of your autonomy in the most fundamental of ways. And therefore, you know, to, be, to be for freedom and for free will is to be consistent. You cannot say that I'm okay about freedom for the big ideas, you know, the abstract things, but really feel uncomfortable with freedom to consume crap, right? That's inconsistency. You cannot really do that and, 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 and challenge the powers of determinism. On, Je on Jeff's point, I only just want, it's not really a criticism or a questioning, but uh, an addition in many ways, which is that one of the clearest expressions of determinism in the legal domain is the juridification of everyday life in Europe where literally anything that we now do comes with a, a code of conduct, an informal convention, a little rule, and, a, and, a, and these days, you know, you cannot go to the toilet to take a leak without there being a series of rules that you've got, got to follow. And, and, and as you will know, so many aspects of our intimate personal life is now regulated so systematically uh, that I think we, we need to be aware of the fact that these limitations are not expressed as an, as an attempt to curb our freedom. <coughs> In fact, they're often expressed as an attempt to defend our freedom. Many of these schools are, are, are expressed as we're protecting you from being offended, we're protecting you from all these other things. But actually, it, it, it is a way of denying us uh, the potential to exercise our autonomy. So it is a, a very disturbing and important development. Okay, Peter, do you want to come back on that or on anything else? Absolutely. I, um, I'm in favour of people making small choices as well as big ones. Absolutely. I think you should choose what colour dress you wear. Absolutely. Um, I think you should be able to eat uh, uh, hamburgers if that's what you want to, absolutely. I grew up in uh, South Africa, which was a, an extremely restrictive society uh, where the state made lots of choices on our behalf. I mean, it wasn't just the apartheid thing. Uh, all sorts of things were, uh, were uh, banned and, 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 and uh, choice was considerably restricted, and I absolutely agree with Frank. To, if you're going to defend big freedoms, you've got to defend little ones too. But I also want to come back just very briefly um, and say I wasn't making an argument that, that we should think that we're free. I was making an argument that we must be free. Um, I, I really do believe if we aren't free, words are meaningless. The words being used in this conversation are not semantically different from the words that a, that a Tourette sufferer ejects uh, automatically in, into the conversation. Uh, the, if they're not being chosen by me, they're genuinely not meaningful. Hello, yeah, I, just, um, I guess um, I agree with an awful lot of what the panel says, particularly, um, particularly Frank as a teacher. Um, uh, you know, uh, I can see a lot of, um, lot of what you're saying in, in contemporary society. I guess the question I'd like to ask all of you is, um, is whose fault is it? Um, and, and, and in alliance with that, why is it happening now, this kind of big focus on, um, on determinism? Um, you know, Claire mentioned this point about the Enlightenment and science how bring us back. Well, science and most good scientists would still it sort of endorse the, you know, sort of Popper's idea of falsifiability and things like that, the idea that actually they're not proving things, they are the best explanation for now. So I guess, what is it in society that's turning these into what this determinism into truth? Is it the media? Is it government? Is it, you know, who's most responsible? Who should we be angry with? Mine is less of a question, it's just a few thoughts, no, having fine. heard of the, what the panel shared with us. I think so far what I've heard is, is um, looking at this um, topic from a quite egocentric point of view as how do we uh, form our own free will or express them. Um, what I was thinking is uh, maybe as much as we think over time we are forming this free will, um, actually in an evolutionary context, nature had chosen it for us in the context of um, you know, the one, the, the idea that is more enhancing to human society's uh, reproduction that are chosen, for example, you know, the free will that um, help to form the, the, to hold the accountability and responsibility for each other. 
Um, and another thought is, um, we are now in a in a in an age that we are ever more empowered to make free choices in the sense that we are more aware of the options out there. Um, but we also need to realize we are also ever more constrained to make and express those free choices um, because of the digital age, for example, has brought us closer, which means more accountability probably for each other. Um, and the final thought is, may, I'm, I'm not convinced the separation uh, between, um, I think there are two issues here. One is to what extent uh, we can choose freely, and the second issue is to what extent we can express those free choices. Um, I'm, not sh I'm not convinced the separation is made clearly he here, and I think um, we need probably a clearer, more clarity over the separation. The social sciences are, are predicated on, on the, the recognition that uh, there are patterns in human life and that uh, when a price goes up, people by and large buy less of a good. Not everybody all the time, but most of us most of the time. Or if you take the report this week on children growing up without fathers, some come out fine, but there is a pattern that children growing up without fathers seem to get more of certain kinds of problems than children who don't grow up with fathers. And it's those probabilistic uh, tendencies, rather than the cast iron laws, that drive people like Ian Duncan Smith to say, actually, it might make sense to intervene early in certain kinds of uh, communities or certain kinds of families to try to uh, dampen down the, t the tendency uh, for this to emerge. It's not at, at the level of every individual, it's at the level of aggregates. And, I mean, this clearly poses problems too. I mean, if Duncan Smith comes charging into my community and starts trying to affect the way I live, when I'm not one of the people uh, that, that corresponds to, to those kind of outcomes, and I'm going to get very cross. And I'd be interested in hearing the panel's view on what do we do at the aggregate level in terms of public policy interventions, recognising uh, that there is such a thing as free will, recognising there isn't 100% causation, and yet recognising that there are statistical probabilities associated with certain kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, factors. Thanks a lot. There's um, another kind of determinism which actually Frank didn't mention, which I think is technological determinism. And uh, I mean, you can see this, another little metaphor which comes out, you can see this every time you read an article where you read about how the internet or Facebook or uh, Google impacts upon our brains or impacts upon our minds, it, it sort of figures us as these um, pathetic civilians being attacked by missiles or something like that. And there's this kind of... and there's. I think there was a danger, actually, in what Jeffrey Rosen was saying, that he was going quite close to the wind on some of this. Because it, although I think, yes, we do have to recognise that there is a problem with how we are represented through these new media, there's a danger in thinking of it as just something which is kind of being done to us by Google. Because, of course, there is real, there's a real expression of, uh, if you like, a kind of uh, attention. You know, there was once the internet where nobody knew you were a dog, which many people complained about, because it just seemed to make every, uh, the whole of dialogue and debate just kind of free-floating. And now we have a situation where there may be some problems. Actually, I think there are, you know, there are ways of getting around some of this, but uh, I, I think that it, it would be a danger if we were to present this merely as something which is just, uh, you know, a kind of outside pressure that comes from nowhere. And that would be to equally kind of uh, ignore the sociological background and the, and the, and the real kind of um, uh, tension which there is around that question. Um, one thing that really worries me is the extent to which people appear quite happy almost to give up their sense of autonomy um, and to accept determinism almost as a, a security blanket, it seems. Um, I had a conversation with a, a friend of mine who's got a 12-year-old son earlier on in the week and she'd found him smoking. And instead of shouting at him and taking the cigarettes off him, um, she bought him hypnotherapy CDs um, to listen to at night to um, kind of help him over his addiction to cigarettes. And it just seemed like if she could apply the label of uh, he was addicted to cigarettes to him, it was comforting to her and a lot easier to her to accept that that than the fact that he might have made a free choice at a 12 year old, as a 12-year-old to experiment with smoking. Is that, am I being fair or am I just falling into a trap of thinking kind of people are stupid? <laughs> 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 Moving on, yes. 
Um, and, um, you know, is there a case for going back and looking at some of Rousseau's arguments, for example, about forcing people to be free? Can we force people to be free? Can we force people to accept autonomy for their own lives? I'm slightly confused about the panel's stance on science as something progressive. Um, and so my, I've got two related questions. Is there nothing progressive in new forms of behavioural and social psychology that do help us uh, not only understand some of the ways that we behave both individually and socially, and that if we apply those ideas to ourselves, can they not be empowering? Is there nothing empowering, for example, about self-awareness through forms of therapy? Not all forms of therapy make people uh, see themselves as only um, dictated by the past. There are different forms of therapy. Uh, I personally am highly hostile to most forms of therapy, so my question isn't because I'm supporting that, but I'm not sure what the panel stance on Stan sorry, the panel's stance on science is. You seem to be rejecting all forms of insight, whether it's neuroscientific, behavioural psychology, um, as having nothing to say, and therefore we're not moving forward in understanding ourselves and our societies. I just wanted to talk about this point uh, that was made at the back about uh, social science um, and, uh, and the, the, the way at, in that versus... Uh, uh, something that's very deterministic because I think um, just if you take uh, something like early childhood education where if you look at um, uh, people who have experienced say a pro program like Head Start from 30,000 feet over time you see that students like that do actually do better in life um, and you know it's hard, to, it's hard to argue with that but I think the important thing is really understanding that that sort of analysis may show us what happened, but it doesn't really explain why it happens. Um, and the problem is, is that um, when policymakers get hold of something like that, it inevitably becomes not just an in inter interesting observation that is a starting point for changing things, um, it becomes this kind of blunt hammer where you must read to children for 15 minutes a day in the womb. I mean, it really does, you know, actually go to those sorts of extremes. And I think the question, uh, the question it poses to me is that, you know, all of these observations and patterns are interesting, um, but, you know, whose task is it, or who's in, uh, is it, a, is it, um, well, I don't actually think it's a task for policy, but I think that there must be some alternative, maybe a collective moral task to try and uh, use this information um, and to come up with something that is, you know, the opposite of a t deterministic solution. Okay, thanks. Peter, anything you want to pick up? Um, I want to put together four of those questions into one answer. Who's to blame? Well, the scientists give us the sense of being determined, I think, to some extent, but they're not to blame. And I love science, and I think it's great that, that, that science is telling us more and more about ourselves. That's a good thing, not a bad thing, and it can be an empowering thing and a helpful thing. So who's to blame? I, su I suspect part of the story is we are. We accept this view of ourselves as determined by these forces, and it comes down to, the, to the, the, what the woman uh, with, uh, at the back there said about uh, the, the, the young man who was smoking. Um, it, it makes us feel more comfortable. Actually, being free is actually quite a scary business. Um, and then, finally, how do you be free? Well, I would say I'm an old Aristotelian. I think uh, being uh, living a good life is about being happy. So I think... Um, Learn to, 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 be, to enjoy being yourself is, is the best way to learn to be free. Thank you very much. Jeff? Uh, let me begin with the technological determinism point because it was addressed to, to me. Uh, I am not by any means arguing that it's not the amygdala's fault, it's all Google's fault. Uh, on the contrary, this is an argument against determinism. The architectures that Google and Facebook use that affect our identities are a matter of choice. And we could demand, for example, technologies of digital deletion. Facebook could, if it chose, make it easy for us to delete our past, for ha to have a post last only for a day or a month or a year. Uh, they've chosen not to do so because of their business model. They want to track us as consumers and uh, it's the uh, corporate interests rather than constitutional values that have determined one architecture rather than another. So we bear responsibility for the architectures 
of uh, identity that uh, shape our lives. But in the end, I uh, agree with all of my uh, uh, panelists that we must not let ourselves be reduced to our Google profiles, and we have to insist that our uh, who, who we are can only be known in context by those who actually know us face to face, and we, we need to resist uh, the idea that we're nothing more than our uh, profiles. As, in, ter in terms of who's to blame, I think we are uh, to blame but in a more specific sense too. The reason that uh, neuroscience and uh, biological explanations are flourishing is because there is an audience for them. Uh, as a journalist, I write articles about the brain on the stand because people love to read about why they're really not responsible for their freely chosen uh, actions. It makes us feel good in a relativistic and democratic age. So, uh, so, uh, so, 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 so the fault, uh, yes indeed, the, the, the fault, dear, dear audience, is it's not only Brutus, but it's, it's all of you guys who are about eating, this stuff, <laughs> eating this stuff up. Do you go along with this uh, self-flagellation, Frank? Uh, anyway. A bit of self-flagellation is never a bad thing. You know, <laughs> as long as it's done in good taste. Um, in, in terms of who's to blame, I think, uh, I, I, I kind of explain it to myself, is that it's uh, an expression of the crisis of causality that we're experiencing, where we find it very difficult to m maturely deal with causes and effect in, in, in contemporary society. And there are many, many expressions of that. I think one of the, the clearest expressions is that we're not very good at dealing with probabilities. When somebody raised a, a point about probabilities in the back, we avoid dealing with probabilities by developing a very robust culture of risk aversion where risk is pathologized and, and, and is seen as a really, really bad thing. And the, again, to go back to the metaphors, the, the, the metaphors that we use that most clearly expresses our aversion to risk is zero tolerance. I think, you know, to go back to the question about social science, is that yes, you know, sort of we can see patterns, and yes, you, know, you, you don't need to have a PhD in sociology to know that a child growing up in a single-parent household has got the kind of problems that a child in a, in a, in a, in a more a two-parent family it doesn't necessarily as an aggregate experience. And we know that you, know, you can look at certain social situations and predict the likelihood of developments. That, that's what social scientists do. They can look at the patterns. Um, so I think that that's, that's a good thing. But social science doesn't say that anything in inevitable is going to occur in those circumstances. And most important of all, you know, what social science shouldn't do is to devise policies that will set people on the right road uh, to overcome this so-called deficit that they're facing. Because the one thing that we do know is that whatever the problem is in growing up in a particular family, it's not going to be helped by policy intervention. I mean, that's what experience shows. It's actually going to make things even worse. And I'm often really surprised when you have someone like Ian Duncan Smith, who is against state regulation when it comes to business, and EU regulation, but for some reason, regulation is perfectly all right when it comes to our private lives. I think there's a, at least a double standard, if not a triple one, you know, so that, that actually sort of, sort of goes on there. And just find okay, final uh, yeah. on science. I mean, science is great. Physics is very exciting. There's a number of science where incredible things being done. I don't think that evolutionary psychology or behavioral economics has really told us very much about ourselves. I think it's told us a, a lot about behavioral economists an evolutionary psychologist fantasy <laughs> rather than Okay, thanks. Steve? Yeah, I'm, if I can just pick up a few of these themes. Uh, people have already addressed the who's to blame. I want to address the why now uh, question that was raise, raised at the very beginning. And I think what we, the reason why now is part of, we're seeing part of a very long-standing trend from really started with the Enlightenment, which is in fact precisely the quest to assert the idea of freedom has actually ironically brought us to the... Uh, the kind of situation that Frank is talking about with these intrusions in our private life. And I think this is quite well uh, described in the work of Michel Foucault, uh, Discipline and Punishment, where he says basically, you know, in the pre-enlightened period, people didn't think they were free. Uh, and indeed, if they tried to behave in ways that uh, uh, were at odds with those in power, they were publicly executed and tortured and all the rest of it. And that we've had an historical move with the Enlightenment away from that kind of operation of power in, in polity to the internalization of norms of behavior in the individual as a consumer and the justification of providing information to try to guide that so that we uh, perhaps don't have 
regulation about what's in a can of beans, but we have a list of incomprehensible information about the nutritional content of the can of beans to enable us to make the, the sensible and healthy choice. And I think it's part of that process of the development of what Foucault called governmentality. Uh, that's a pun in French as well. Uh, it's the mentality of, of, of self-governance. Um, I think there's also another uh, aspect here, which was raised by the second speaker, uh, second questioner, who used the phrase, or invoked the phrase, about nature making choices for us. And I think it's very important to pay attention to the linguistic conventions and norms that we actually uh, adhere to or, 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 or use in these kinds of conversations. Because, of course, nature doesn't make choices. These were metaphors that came up with the development of evolutionary theory and the idea of the selfish gene and all the rest of it. And in a sense, what we've done is we've, we, we've made a linguistic slip in attributing uh, or, or displacing uh, volition from ourselves to nature. And once again, I think it's part of that rhetorical use of nature as a way of uh, actually um, shaping our behavior. F just Very finally, great. a quick question on choices. Uh, I think it's important to recognize uh, that there are two fundamentally different models of choice, at least two fundamentally different models of choice within social science. And one is that of the economist, which is basically the selection of options from well-ordered alternatives. And that's basically what economic theory is all about. And then there's choice, which is actually the choice that's made by uh, negotiation and by interaction and is an, an emergent property uh, of our conversations and our interactions uh, with each other. And those are very different kinds of models of choice and represent very different kinds of alternative ideologies of freedom and of free will. I kind of want to challenge the idea that all intervention is, is a bad idea. I mean, um, it seems like sort of personal intervention by, by friends and other people in the society uh, when, they, when the intentions are good, um, and maybe to a small extent by the government, you know, in terms of educating people rather than, rather than forcing them to do things, it is a really good idea. Very quickly, really relating to what Jeff and Frank said, Jeff, about, the, about Google and um, the woman whose photograph ended up with her working in human resources, um, and Frank about uh, probability and zero tolerance. I think there's a big issue about pro our proportionality of response to such issues as well. There was... Uh, James Hillman wrote a wonderful book called We've Had a Hundred Years of Psychotherapy and the World is Getting Worse. But I was also like to, to just mention that the French, the, the um, subject of Aubli, um, the French never let you do that because you have to use your maiden name for absolutely everything. So whereas in England, of course, you can change your identity by deed of poll, you certainly can't do that in France. And one last thing is that responsibility to be free is in a way to understand that the word responsibility is the ability to respond. And when you've responded to something, then you can start to make some choices. Yeah, I was on a um, radio discussion recently uh, defending football fans shouting offensive things. It was, it was in Celtic Rangers related. And it was very strange that suddenly the, uh, the presenter of the program started to say when people were phoning in, yes, we know those words, don't say, we don't need to say those words, okay? And I'm, I'm wondering whether there's a kind of almost linguistic determinism now that we don't even want people to say, the words would have been Fenian bastard or orange bastard or hun or something like that. And then all the folk, people phoning in started to say, I'll not say those words, but you know the words we mean, right? And within half an hour, these words that people casually use in conversation to slag each other off had become like these really scary hot potatoes. And I think this is very strange that there seems to be this kind of power given to these petty words, which are incredible. And people start to adopt and say, well, you know, we, we can't even mention them on a radio program. Um, there's been a lot of talk about us being held to our past with Google, knowing exactly what we've done. As generations move on, and those of us that aren't used to having our past blasted all over the internet die out, will society change and develop and become more accepting of the fact that, yes, when I was 18, I got a bit high and got a bit too drunk and climbed on a statue, but I can change by the time I'm in my 30s and that doesn't matter so much? <laughs> 
Just when people were asking why now, I mean, one of the things that I think is a very important consideration is, although you could say, well, why now when it all started with the Enlightenment, I, I mean, based on the why now in the last 10 years rather than that far back, um, I think we do have to recognise that there has, you know, that we've lost faith in the project of politics. And politics was about uh, the, the, the notion that one could completely transform the world that we lived in. That has been seen to be... Or, and I think wrongly, but nonetheless, people have said that was a waste of time. You know, look up. You know, we, we tried to have revolutions; they went bad. Uh, you know, the the whole left and right thing. We live in a post-ideological age, and so on. And I think that that just that whole mindset of a slightly limited vision of what the future will hold has fed into a sort of sense of hopelessness about ourselves. Although, I, although I think we can sort of say it's our fault. I mean, obviously, ultimately, we ought to not accept this more fatalistic thinking. Um, I think it is it is tempting to say, um, you know, my my child is naughty because of some medical condition or some you know some explanation that means that you don't have to take responsibility and 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 so on. I think that I think that what um, I've often noticed is that there's also I mean we do we have lost confidence in each other. And the thing that's most galling, because I, I, I came from education, is, is that it used to be the case that if you were a teacher, you would say that it didn't matter what kind of background a child was from, your responsibility as the teacher, which you kind of adopted with missionary zeal, was that you would educate them. And you'd say, well, they might be from the poorest background, they might have no books in the house, their parents might be terrible, they might have any number of things. I don't care. My job is to educate the child. Now when I speak at education conferences, it's the teachers who say, the problem is not our fault. The problem is, is that we are restricted in how far we can educate these children because the parents are neglecting them at home and not reading to them. And anyway, what happens in the first three years of somebody's life determines broadly what happens. So we do what we can. So they then say, well, of course we do what we can. But it's never, and, and it's always somebody else's, and so on. So, I think that there's some, I think that we have to uh, really challenge that uh, when we hear it. But there's no way that we've dealt with all of this today. This is just the start of this conversation. So I'm going to ask the panel to give us their final thought, but also ask you to kind of mull over some of these things and keep raising them throughout the weekend because it's very much a big theme uh, of the festival. So, Jeff, can you give us your final thought for this session, please? It's absolutely right, as the questioner said, that we're suffering from a lack of proportionality. And the question for the future, as the last questioner asks, is will we develop new norms of forgiveness and of judging each other in context? Uh, I am not one of those meliorists who say, uh, in 20 years, we'll all just be comfortable living in glass houses and we'll forgive all, each other for all of our youthful transgressions. The truth is, as we know, that there will always be some uh, form of shame. We don't know now what will disqualify the politician of the year 2050. It won't be the drunken Facebook photo. It will be something else. So shame will not uh, disappear, and we need laws that allow us to uh, protect our identity. Uh, the woman who said that in France you can't abandon your maiden name gives one good example. Here in Britain there's a new law proposed that would only absolve internet service providers of liability on the internet if they end anonymity and turn over the actual identities of all posters. This would be a disaster with grave effects on our ability to parcel out bits of our identity. But I am cautiously optimistic in the long term that we can develop new ways of forgiving each other, new forms of empathy, and new ways of putting in context the digital trails that will follow ourselves forever. Thank you very much. And uh, Steve? Yeah, two things. I'd like to take up very briefly the uh, point about the failure of politics or the loss of faith in politics. Um, full disclosure, I am a joint US-UK uh, citizen. I hold both passports. Uh, I see a failure of politics in both countries, but a tr completely different kind of response. Uh, whereas I think here we've had the, uh, the kind of fatalism that we've been describing today. In the US, in fact, exactly the opposite, where the far right has taken an extraordinarily uh, hard and uh, line position, really uh, uh, very often, in fact, refusing to accept uh, any kind of uh, information for, from uh, science with respect to uh, a whole wide range of issues and asserting very much their individual personal 
uh, uh, freedom in the, in, in the US tradition. So I think you can have a, a very different response to that failure of politics from the one that we experience here in the UK and in Europe, and I think that they both uh, are highly problematic. Uh, then the final point is this whole question that's come up several times about the use of science and the use of social science. Of course, we shouldn't be throwing out either the science or the social science baby with the bathwater here. Uh, both have the potential to inform us. After all, as, as Moritz Schlick said, if there are not regularities in our social and in our natural worlds, all our actions are random and are therefore meaningless, as indeed um, uh, uh, Peter has suggested our words would be meaningless. Uh, but I think we need to be very careful listen to science when it describes the state of the world, but be very suspicious when science prescribes what we should do. Because that's usually the point at which scientists are slipping into being stealth advocates uh, and moving away from being scientists. All science is being appropriated for an advocacy position to use the rhetorical power of its only natural to persuade and to coerce. Thank you very much. Uh, Frank? Yeah, I mean, sometimes when I get a little bit demoralized, I read poetry or look at art and you often There's find... There's more to it than that, the art, yeah. by the way. Well, yeah. uh, it's my therapy. I kind of find, you know, the other day I was looking at some poems and you find, you know, stone walls that a prison make or iron bars a cage and you realise that there's a, a, a sense in which our freedom is something that we feel quite passionate about. There's something within us. You know, there's a side of us that strives to be free. And I do think that one of the, the big challenges for us is to give that a clearer cultural expression. And one, of the, one of the things I want to do before I drop dead is to actually you know, play a role in rehabilitating the idea of freedom and liberty. And you might say, well, why, you know, why even talk about rehabilitating the idea of freedom and liberty? We all believe in it. But actually, when you go to a bookshop or you go to a library, you will find there are far more articles written uh, about criticizing the idea of liberty and of freedom, saying what a narrow idea it is. It's the freedom for the rich, or it's the liberty for that. And in any case, how, how, do you, how can you possibly think you're genuinely free? There is nature, there is wealth, there are the markets, there is globalization. I mean, all these things you know, mean that freedom is nothing. And it seems to me that because of this very pessimistic account, uh, in a philosophical sense, but also in a religious sense or political sense, we do need to take freedom far more seriously. And we do need to argue it in a much more ruthless, you know, non-compromising way, and not give ground to those little, little niggling criticism. We all know that freedom is always conditional. We all know that freedom has always got obstacles that it's got to overcome. We all know that as individuals, we are sometimes very weak and very fragile and unable to give expression to our freedom. But nevertheless, you know, we always have to remember that snow malls do not a prison make. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I think some part of the problem with our understanding our own freedom is that we don't know what we mean by it. Sometimes uh, I think we mean, we want to say freedom's about being left alone to be myself, left alone by other people, not interfered with. And that's why I really liked um, Steve's uh, point about the, the different ways in which uh, we make choices. There is a kind of economic model of choices, but there is another kind of model of choices where choices are about relationships, about relating to other people. And so I actually think our biggest freedoms come from the ways in which we relate to other people and build friendships in things like, uh, fora like this. Uh, thank you very much to all of our panel. Uh, uh